Caroline, did you have any idea what impact this campaign was going to have? Because when I spoke about it on the show for the first time, the response from viewers was overwhelming. OK, so, so many of us started on Twitter and social media. So we really started small. We were scared. Many of us were anonymous. We found each other, Twitter, Facebook, Mumsnet, and um, slowly got bigger and braver, started our different groups, uh, Women's Rights Network, um, Sex Matters, um, all of Women Uniting are from different political parties. And so from that small beginning, <laughs> we started this campaign. And I think... You know what, sorry, let me just... Finish. Yes, yeah, no, we, we originally just thought, you know, we'll be going for it on Twitter, we might be trying to get it trending. So it's been successful beyond, beyond our wildest, wildest dreams, dreams and it just shows everybody's ready for it. Everybody's ready to mm. speak out loud about this subject and to say that sex matters. And I think what's obviously really important is you brought the groups together as well. So yes. it's a united voice. Uh, mm -hmm. Heather, can you just explain for people who don't know what the fundamental goal of the campaign is and how people can get involved? Because what you're essentially saying is that before the local elections, there's a real opportunity, isn't there, to test the people who you're going to be voting for? Well, huge opportunity. All, what I know from all the women in the network, and also outside the network, we hear from others, anyway, is that women are politically homeless at the moment. They, they don't know who to vote for. They, they don't feel they can vote for Labour or uh, Lib Dems or, you know, they're just not getting the response from politicians that they want in terms of what happens for it, what, what it means for them. And so responding to that, we thought, well, let's get these questions out there. I mean, you've, you've seen there's been plenty of footage of the um, government politicians stumbling over this thing. It's such a difficult thing. I'm not a biologist. It's complicated, <laughs> you know, and it, this is so frustrating uh, to women. This, it is not complicated. This is the easiest thing in the world. It's only compli complicated if, A, you're being bullied, or B, you think the votes are sitting in another direction. So this was a big moment to try and get those questions out. It's local, local politics, so we really didn't think we'd have the biggest, this big impact that we have, as Caroline said. But get the questions asked at the doorstep. Uh, I think it was David Lamy, or quite a number of them, said this, this never arises on the doorstep. So we thought, <laughs> yeah. right, never It's one. going to. It's going well, to look, change You, you that. talk about those politicians and, and their reaction. So I've put together some of the best, or you might say the worst. <laughs> so let's take a look, and Helen, I'll get you to respond off the back. She's a woman. Well, I thought the Prime Minister uh, answered this brilliantly in Prime Minister's Question Times. In Prime Minister's Questions this week, and I fully agree with him. Wait, and so what is your definition of a woman? Uh, as I said, I would exactly agree with what the Prime Minister said at Prime Minister's Question Time. When we're having a social media or a debate around whether someone's, what genitalia someone's got, I think it really debases the serious issues that people face. A I woman can't have a penis. I don't think that um, discussing this issue in this way helps anyone in the long run. People are complex that they that and that they are different well i have to say that there are different definitions legally around what a woman actually is i mean you look at the definition within the equality act and i think it just says um uh, someone who is um adult and female i think but then doesn't say how you define either of those things is it transphobic to say only women have a cervix uh, look, uh, 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 is it is it transphobic uh, look uh, I just, I don't even know how to start answering these questions. Helen, <laughs> I mean, this is why we need your campaign, right? Your reaction. It's extremely painful to watch, isn't it? It is. I mean, for two reasons. One is they all know they're going to get asked. So would you, for the love of God, would you please prepare a decent yeah. answer and just say it? If you're going to talk absolute nonsense, would you not do the whole stuttering rubbish beforehand? <laughs> uh, but the second thing is, why are we asking this question? It's not because we want to catch somebody out. It's not a gotcha question. It's not a trivial question. The reason is that some of our human rights are sex-based rights. Some of them are for men, some of them are for women, some of them require that you can say who is a man and who is a woman. Child safeguarding, for example. It is impossible to keep children safe if you cannot talk about human sex. Yeah. If you cannot say this person is male, 
this person is female, those two people should not be in this space sleeping together. If you cannot say those things, you cannot keep children safe. You cannot give pe women dignity and privacy. And so it's not a gotcha question. We're asking people, can you give women safety, privacy and dignity? Mm. Do you know what child safeguarding is? And the short way to, to, to ask that question of somebody is to say, what's a woman? What's sex? Indeed. And Karen, I think it's also really important to point out, isn't it, that that doesn't make you transphobic. <laughs> Absolutely not. So what, that's what you're accused yeah. of a lot. Yeah. So I would say we're all across our campaign very clear that in a free society we can all explore our identity, um, describe ourselves how we like, dress how we like, love who we want to love. So we can explore our identity, but sex is real and sex matters. Mm. As Helen said, you know, very particularly for women, for our dignity, our privacy and our safety in prisons, in hospital wards, in sports. So identify how you like, but sex is real and sex matters. Helen, you're one of the women who was cancelled, really, weren't you, for talking about, uh, talking out on this, speaking out on this issue, sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean... Because you were you were literally not allowed to speak at certain events, for, for example. Uh, yeah, so that's true. That but is we, we ran better ones. to women. We ran better ones instead. But it uh, is shocking, yeah. isn't it? It, it is, is shocking. It is shocking because if you look at J.K. Rowling, and she is obviously the most high-profile example, and obviously she can maybe deal with it better than other women who are worried, and I, and I have read what you've all said, you are approached by women who say they are scared to speak out mm. because they're worried about losing their jobs, for example. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I'm a journalist, and until very recently I was The Economist's Britain editor, and they've been extremely good to me and have given me a leave of absence to go and work at Sex Matters, so I can't say my career has suffered. But just very recently I was invited to come and talk to a bunch of trainee child psychiatrists who want to know more about how you how you treat gender questioning children. Very important question, because some treatment pathways put you on the path to sterility, mm. to permanent interventions when you're still very young. And um, they dropped me from the program because some of the people who disagree that you should be careful, go slow, uh, do exploratory work with children before you do uh, irreversible treatments. Some of those people sent the most outrageous defamatory remarks about me to the organisers and in the end they had to drop me and then in the end the conference was actually cancelled. So I don't care so much about me. I care about the fact that there are children. Mm. And this conversation has yeah. been had. Yes. Heather, women's sport, it's a real passion of mine. I absolutely love it and if you look at some of these organisations like Stonewall, it, if, it feels like if the sporting bodies are going to continue to listen to them, women's sport I believe, is at a uh, genuine risk. Do you feel the same? Absolutely. There's no women's sport. There will just be sport. And it used to be, there used to be a time when it was just sport and then women's sport came along. Cycling, I think it was 1984, before women's cycling was in the Olympics. I'm not sure if that's your lifetime, Dan, but it's just. not... Just. It's not that long ago. No, it's and not. It's absolutely absurd that finally... We had women's sports and for some reason, some people in society think that they want to be part mm. of that. And team sports too. I mean, I'm a big supporter of the London Pulse netball team <laughs> and all you would need is one non-biological female in that team and the whole game goes out the window. The whole game goes out the window, but also there's somebody that's not taking part because that place is taken well, yes. by yes. a man. Now, that's happening at the grassroots. So we're not just talking elite sports here. That's right. Down on the ground, yeah, yeah. community level sports. So, uh, so people so are dropping out. So there will not be any elite women because women, they're just walking no. away from it. They're saying, I don't want to play football with men. And I think it was Guam over the weekend, was it? Three women injured in a rugby match because there was a male player on the other side. Shocking. So, so does this require this government intervention? If they don't, if they don't fix it, then yes. yes. I mean, the interventions that we've had to, to take, not me personally, I've had to take, have been through the courts. That is fixing a lot of it. That is redressing the picture through the courts. So maybe it will be some nice big court case because somebody's been seriously injured. Yeah, but we don't sport. want it to get to that point. That's no, of course thing. we don't. We want it this to just get back. Now, Helen, finally, you know I'm going to ask you this, <laughs> this lunch that it feels like the whole yeah. world was talking about. So J.K. Rowling 
invited a whole load of campaigners who've been in a relatively similar position to her to party, basically. And, and, and what went down? What was it like? I mean, it was, you know, <laughs> <laughs> nearly 20 women sitting around talking about our nails and our hair and our makeup <laughs> and our kids and our knitting and our cooking. That is not what we did. Yes. <laughs> uh, we had a lovely lunch. There was a lot of laughing, a lot of chat. Um, just what you would get if you had a bunch of people who've been dying to get together after the pandemic, who've been supporting each other on social media. Uh, jo has been very kind and very generous in support of women who... She, she swoops in when she sees that somebody is being un put under attack. She does. She was very supportive to my colleague Maya Forstatter, for yes. example, when Maya was... Uh, was kicked out of her job. At so, great yeah. cost, by the way. Mm, and and yeah. we're not talking yes. financially here. But J.K. Rowling has essentially been hounded out of Hollywood. That is mm. just a fact. Uh, how much of an inspiration is the stand that she's taken for someone like you? I mean, it's, it's actually impossible to, to express fully. So people did stand up at this din at this lunch and say a few words, several people just spontaneously, and there were tears. A couple of people stood up and said, if you hadn't reached out to me, I don't know what I would have done. Um, I handed her a copy, a preprint copy of my paperback book, um, which is out on the 5th of May, and got her to write in it, and it will be now my most treasured possession is that copy of that book. Amazing. She said that it had been uh, a game changer, I think, was what she said, and Amazing. I'll be proud of that forever. Well, look, what you're doing is absolutely brilliant. It's so important. And I'm literally now, you know, usually I dread the MP arriving at my door. <laughs> and I now cannot wait because I've no. got a question to ask. You must let us know what Oh, I will. Says. I'm going to record it. I'm going to yeah. record it and I will be ready to roll. We have had some run away. <laughs> really? <Yes. laughs> but look, you're making a big change. Thank you so much for being here. It's a brilliant campaign. That was Caroline Fisk, Heather Binning and Helen Joyce, the brave women's rights advocates running the Respect My Sex If You Want My Ex campaign.